She has stood proudly at the intersection of 6th and Main for more than 100 years. Today, the Newman Building continues to shine as a centerpiece of downtown Joplin. If these walls could talk, they would have quite a story to tell. What would these walls say? Maybe they would say... You know, we, uh, we were uh, probably the cornerstone of the downtown area for so many years, and, and thank you for not forgetting us that there is good memories and, and still good memories to be had in this building, and, and uh, thank you for the thoughts of keeping it. When you enter the Newman Building, the tall columns on the first floor catch your eye. Those columns have supported the building since it opened in 1910 as a department store. They stood tall during the difficult times of an uncertain future. They continue to stand tall today as the home of Joplin City Hall. The story is one that echoes the history of the city. It goes beyond that of a building to that of the people that make Joplin strong. You know, I think that if the building itself could speak, it would, um, it would be proud of, of a community that has not only stood by it, but stood by each other. In the early 1900s, a Joplin retailer had a dream to build a large department store to meet the demands for goods in the booming mining town. That dream became a reality with the opening of Newman's Department Store in November of 1910. It was the largest department store in a 150-mile radius. The director of the Joplin Museum Complex, Brad Belk, describes Joplin at that time. Of course, you know, 1910 is a, a bustling time for the community. Uh, the lead and zinc mining industry has really taken hold and uh, there's great activity not only in the mining fields but in downtown Joplin too. So the building of the Newman uh, construction I'm sure was a, uh, a monumental day and uh, something that everybody remembered because of the size of the structure. The Newman building was indeed a skyscraper in its days, built along the lines of the Chicago style architecture with five stories and a basement. The building boasted that it was fireproof. Joplin native Austin Allen designed the building, adding special features to his hometown retail palace. Allen was known for designing other notable Joplin buildings, including St. Peter's Catholic Church and the Elks Lodge. But it was the Newman building that stood out with the ultimate in building features. From the outside, people immediately noticed the large windows built within a skeleton of reinforced concrete curtain wall construction. Windows on the third floor opened up to balconies with railings containing the letter N on the decorative cast iron wreaths. Large storefront bay windows caught the attention of people passing by, displaying merchandise. Sidewalk canopies and copper pediments added to the exterior. On the rooftop, a large sign spelled out the name Newman's. The interior of the building attracted people and gave them many memories. On the first floor, the tall concrete columns stood out, reaching up to the 30-foot ceilings. Topping the columns were ornate garland and swag designs. If you were heading up to the mezzanine level, the grand staircase would get you there. At the base of the stairs, pedestals supported large electric glass globes. Cast iron railings were around the edges with decorative floral wreaths in the letter N. A beautiful stained glass window greeted customers at the top of the staircase. The letter N stood out in the center. It featured decorative depictions of the time period showing a cityscape, a boat and train, and a horn of plenty, perhaps sharing the optimism of the booming time period. A postcard from the time shows the building at night with the lights on, describing it as the Southwest's greatest department store at night. The Newman Building also presented a unique aspect for its time, elevators. Today we take elevators for granted, but at the turn of the 20th century, people weren't used to riding them. The store offered sales on upper floors to encourage people to use the elevators. Ornate drinking fountains also greeted customers. One of those fountains is now displayed at the Joplin Museum Complex. Newman's was so proud of the building that it gave away postcards in 1911 featuring the interior. These postcards captured the large open floors with merchandise displays. Going beyond the first floor, shoppers found the men's department on the second floor. There they would find rich woodwork, including polished wooden floors and mahogany display cases. The third floor featured items for women. These included the latest fashions in ready-to-wear clothing, millinery, furs, and infant wear. Moving up to the fourth floor, shoppers found porcelain, china, and glass, as well as toys, sporting goods, and home furnishings. The top floor is where Newman's housed offices for the store, stock rooms, and a decorator's office. Newman's actually had six floors of usable space with a basement, hand dug by workers when the building was constructed. One area of the building not seen by everyone was the roof. Newman's held company picnics there, and employees enjoyed items such as swings and a dance pavilion, and a bird's eye view of Joplin. Newman's was certainly a reflection of the excitement and growth in cities at the turn of the century. 
Well, Joplin seemed to be kind of reflecting what the other urban communities were doing, and uh, large uh, multi-story department stores were, were very prevalent in other communities, and so Joplin just began uh, their own uh, style and uh, were adopting what was going on in other communities. You know, the large department store offered uh, sort of one-stop shopping to some degree, and therefore uh, there was something on every floor, and for the, for the man, the woman, the children, uh, there's some place for everybody to find uh, goods. I think the, the building um, stands as a testimony through the time and the decades that it reflected. Through the many decades, the Newman Building stood tall in Joplin, serving as a magnet for people coming to town. But, the, uh, but the real, one of the real uh, important points of, uh, of the Newman Building was the accessibility, the ability to be able to get there in the early days by trolley. Uh, all these uh, mining communities were interconnected by this inner urban system and it was very convenient uh, traveling uh, and somewhat affordable uh, but uh, definitely reliable and so therefore you could be in um, uh, Oklahoma or Kansas and, and come to the spend a day uh, in Joplin downtown and uh, also do some shopping at, at the Newman department store. Newman's department store became a big success in Joplin. Annual sales climbed to more than $1 million by the early teens. By the end of its first decade in operation, the store had more than 300 people on the payroll and was known as the big store in Joplin. As America and Joplin moved through the century, Newman's adapted and offered the latest goods for customers. Bill Schwab, chairman of Newman's for nearly 40 years, explains. The Newman Company was the first store in the area to have one price merchandise. Uh, prior to that, when you went to a general store to buy something of a relatively permanent nature, you bargained with the owner at the price because it, the price was coded on the back of a sales ticket so that the public wasn't aware of what the merchant paid for it, but he could take whatever price he wanted for it. It was his after all. And so uh, you could make a deal buying goods, but uh, the idea of a one price merchant uh, didn't come into vogue until uh, the early 1900s. A look at advertisements for Newman's throughout the decades show the wide variety of merchandise, giving Joplin area shoppers the ability to buy the latest in fashions and technology. But it was more than the merchandise that brought people to Newman's. Customers came for the personal service they received from employees. The employees, in turn, felt like family, working together to serve the customers. Throughout the years, many people took home special memories. Yeah, that's the whole thing about the Newman building. Everybody has their own history, uh, their own uh, feelings of what occurred there. And that's what's fun, uh, that you know, history isn't just for historians, it's for everybody. And everybody experiences it differently. So the ability to, to walk in the store, to have, a, have your own memories, and to recall those uh, is what, uh, what history is all about. The recollection of these, uh, of these ages of, of development uh, you know, is, uh, is your own personal history, and that adds to your own file and, and creates your own memories. So you know, we're all a part of Joplin's history, and we all have a, a story to tell. Those memories are shared by many and tell the story of the building. June Maddie Blaylock was born in Joplin and had early family ties to the building. Well, my mother worked in the credit department under Mr. Robb before she married my father, and Dad didn't want her to work, so, but she was there before 1912. Well, it was like a piece of New York right down in the middle of Joplin. Many people share those stories of having visited the building, only to go on later to work in the store. Well, my earliest memories was going to the store with my mother because my aunt worked on the fifth floor of Newman's in the china and crystal and silver and the toy department, the most beautiful toy department in the city. And uh, I can remember going up there when I was, oh, probably five years old on up until I started working there in uh, display in 1946. I think one of the biggest events I remember of the store, to me, was the Colleen Moore dollhouse. And I have talked with several friends, and they don't remember Colleen Moore. She was a movie actress, and she had 
a dollhouse, and it wasn't a dollhouse as such, like a dollhouse with little rooms. It was more like, um, well, more like Queen Mary's dollhouse. It's in Windsor Castle. I mean, it was beautiful. It took um, all night to set it up because I got to go up with my aunt, naturally being on the fifth floor, got to go up and watch them setting it up. And I can remember particularly one room was um, Rockabye Baby in the Treetops. <laughs> and it was a beautiful tree. And the, the baby was up in the tree and it was all animated and voice a video and everything and it it sang rockabye baby in the treetops when the wind blows and then it would fall down and it was it was beautiful and then cinderella's at the ball and the chandeliers were like beautiful they were diamonds real and it was it was gorgeous just beautiful and the glass miniature glass slipper on the staircase and the coach with the coachman it was a, it was really a, a lovely thing to have set up there in the store that i remember so very well in the late 1940s joe greer worked at newman's she captures the atmosphere of the post-war boom days in joplin people would come down on saturday and just walk up and down main street you know and shop if they didn't shop they just came down to visit and to see their neighbors and friends and um of course, the Frisco building across the street had all the doctors, offices, and dentists. And um, they really didn't have a lot of activity other than just people coming down, you know, but all the stores were full. A word used by many former Newman's employees is family, as they refer to the relationships among co-workers. Jack Lemons worked in the department store for more than 30 years. He recalls the special aspect of work. The very best way you could put it was family. We had a picnic every year out at Schiffendecker Park, and everybody knew everybody else. A lot of people mingled socially, and uh, it was just a great place to work. It was a small town atmosphere, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, we would have our big sales events. We would have a big breakfast at Roberts, if you remember the cafeteria there on, on Joplin. And we had it at other places, but every, everyone was there, and we did little skits, and of course went over all the merchandise going to be on sale, and it was, again, everybody got together. Other employees echo those comments and memories. Gladys Strauss worked there in the 1960s. It was a wonderful place to work, had everything, and they were so good to their employees. They really were very good, and uh, we didn't feel like we were hired help, if you put it that way. But, uh, no, they were wonderful, wonderful people. And I enjoyed every minute of it. I said, it got to claim a lot of people here. And uh, they were very, everybody was very likeable people. You, you knew your customers personally. I mean, it, it was, uh, it was one of the ways that the company prospered because we had to cater to people as individuals, and uh, that's how we made a living. Customers appreciated the personal service provided by employees. I can remember my grandmother there again taking us to the children's department, and that poor sales clerk, she, she always had three of us to deal with. But uh, absolutely, my family, they were on first name basis with this little lady, and. Uh, uh, you know, she always welcomed us when we came to the department and, and uh, always helped them pick out pretty things for us. In the 1960s, Joplin welcomed Missouri Southern College. Students would shop at Newman's for the latest fashions. For some, the opportunity to work at the store helped pay for school and help with those fashion purchases. Linda Klepper was one of those co-eds. My first leather coat, my first pair of leather boots to match, and I, I got there and my my, and that was a really neat leather coat trimmed in rabbit fur, and I got my next fur collared coat, uh, a Norwegian fox, that I could no more have purchased than the man on the moon on a college student's salary if I hadn't gotten all my wonderful 30% discounts. I seldom knew another store in town that was able to do that. 
Zweihoff also had an opportunity to meet the host of American Bandstand, Dick Clark, when he came to host a fashion show at Newman's. It was a lifetime dream. I got to speak to him. I told him the whole story about how I never did get to go on Bandstand when I was on the East Coast. He moved, and now here in the Midwest, I'm getting to meet this man whose show I always wanted to go on because I loved to dance. Newman's continued to host special events at the store. In 1967, a Joplin Globe article mentioned a festival and pointed out that Newman's was the oldest department store in Missouri under the same family ownership. But as the traffic moved along Main Street and Joplin, the city continued to grow outward. Like many communities at the time, this meant opportunities for new shopping areas. Uh, the transition from, uh, you know, started with the, um, the Eastmoreland Plaza and then, uh, and then it moved to the, uh, to the mall. And uh, in the 70s, uh, it seemed to me that uh, almost uh, all that commercial activity was being centralized at that location. It seemed logical, I'm sure, to the Newman folks that uh, they needed to go where the traffic was. And, you know, what we were talking about previously, the traffic used to be right at their front door. Uh, the traffic patterns have changed and moved to, to range lines. In 1972, Newman's closed the store on Main Street and moved to North Park Mall. Newman's grew very much as Joplin did, and uh, we moved to the mall uh, because the mall was a necessary extension of downtown. Uh, downtown was not physically able to support the kind of businesses that uh, developed in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So the mall was necessary for Joplin, and it was necessary for Newman's. Following the department store's departure in 1972, the building entered a 30-year time period of uncertainty, trying to find its new identity. These struggles included various efforts to fill the void in downtown. It, it's hard to replace that Newman store uh, with all those employees and all those, all those goods and services they, they offered um, by, uh, uh, without some super company coming in and, and taking over. So, uh, you know, these large buildings, um, they have a lot of great advantages, but they also have uh, some interesting points uh, to deal with, and that would be, you know, just the heating, cooling, the maintaining of these uh, old historic buildings. The first people to step forward and show an interest in the building were four Joplin businessmen, Joe Harding, Harvey Ants, W.R. Pat Robertson, and Bunny Newton. The building was for sale for $100,000. Bunny Newton explains their efforts. And we put in $25,000 a piece and bought the building. We thought it'd be really a good deal and we could really sell it. You know, we hung on to it for a while and finally we were glad to get rid of it. <laughs> and we just got our $25,000 back out of it. That's about all we did and paid a little taxes and insurance on it. The first new occupant of the building in the post-department store era was the Pentecostal Church of God. Ron Miner served as the church general secretary. He recalls the move and how the building was used. It was quite a job moving in that big equipment and getting everything organized, but we had so much more space uh, there in the Newman building than we did on Wall Street. We used the first floor of the Newman building for a messenger bookstore, mm -hmm. uh, part of it, and then part of it was a, a music center where we sold pianos and organs and that type of thing. And the second floor of the Newman building was uh, an open floor. We actually had one of our conventions on that floor, at least our business sessions. Mm -hmm. Well, on the third floor was, uh, originally was uh, KPCG radio, and uh, it took up most of that floor. The church used the building throughout the 1970s. By 1977, the church was looking to move to develop a new headquarters south of Joplin. A Joplin Globe story in 1977 shared news about the authorization of selling the building and mentioned that Tri-State Motor Transit was interested. However, that deal did not materialize. The building served as international headquarters of the Pentecostal Church of God in the early 1980s. When the church offices and messenger printing moved out of the Newman building, removing the printing equipment was a major challenge, attracting attention downtown. Sections of the sidewalk were removed to remove the equipment from the basement, while cranes were brought in to take out the presses from above. The Newman buildings then stood empty, entering a new era of attempts to serve Joplin. In the mid-1980s, it even served as a haunted house, presented by one of the fraternities at Missouri Southern. 
But it was a Joplin resident, Kenny Cox, who took his dreams for a teen center in the building to city leaders when he bought the building from the Pentecostal Church of God. The struggle to develop the teen center stretched on for three years. Area youth helped with fundraising efforts while the city council heard pitches for the community development funds to help with the center. Cox developed his teen center concept into the boulevard. A story in the Missouri Southern newspaper, The Chart, shared Cox's vision of having a place with groups to provide services to help teens tackle their challenges while also having a place where teenagers could go to have fun. In August 1989, teens hit the dance floor for the first time at the boulevard. The building's basement was remodeled to look like a subway station, complete with booths, flashing lights, and video games. One Joplin resident, Stephanie Goad, recalls visiting the teen center. Uh, they tried that at one point, and they had the old checkered floor when you go in, and then you go down the stairs. So go through, mm -hmm. to the basement. And they had it like a little subway set up. It was, it was really, really neat, and they had a dance floor. And While the building became a new home for Joplin area teens, a step toward its future was taken. The Newman Building was placed on the National Register for Historic Places. However, the success of the teen center could not stop the ongoing challenges of maintaining an aging building. The boulevard closed in 1990. A Joplin Globe editorial lamented the loss of the teen center. Newspaper stories in 1990 talked about bricks falling from the building and stated that Kenny Cox had decided to put the building up for sale. The deteriorating state of the building made headlines in the early 1990s. Doug Hunt served as a member of the Joplin City Council during that time. He recalls how the council faced the challenge of what to do with the building. And I remember there were a lot of times it was, it was tough for us as a council um, to think about the dark possibility of having to raise that building and uh, losing that would have been would have been a, a sad moment in Joplin's history so that didn't happen we're thankful. In late 1992 the Joplin Globe reported interest from two local residents in developing the building. They were identified as Doug Hunt and Rodney Hall. At a news conference they shared a vision of using the building for residential commercial and retail use. However, that plan did not materialize. While the Newman Building became a challenge in downtown Joplin, it was not the only source of concern. A Joplin Globe article featured the vacant building and its neighbor across the street, the Frisco Building. In 1995, both faced a cloudy future. However, later that year, news came out that the Newman Building had new owners, Martin Smith and Greg Fears. An article in the summer covered the restoration work underway, with comments from the developer, Ken Sype. In September 1995, the newspaper reported that papers had been filed with the city stating that the renovation costs would be $545,000. Articles after the next few months continued to cover the progress of the renovation work. Joplin area residents got glimpses of the work underway to preserve one of Joplin's architectural masterpieces. The next fall featured a special event in the building where work was underway. The Joplin Globe reported on an event sponsored by Main Street Joplin and the Historical Society, with 500 people attending a dinner on the first floor. Guests shared their thoughts about the historical significance of the building. The newspaper reporter described the Newman Building as an architectural masterpiece wrapped in elegance. The project to renovate the building continued, with a local firm, Hookup, announcing that they were buying the building and moving its administrative offices there. For those hookup employees who worked there, the Newman Building had an immediate impression. When I got there, it was all open spaces. I think that's what struck me the most, was there was this grand staircase. It was very grandiose and, and just a colossal building. The marble floors that went on forever, intricate molding, um, just something magical about it. And I think it sort of added to the atmosphere and the office culture as well. While Hookup brought new life to the Newman Building, legal and financial problems tied to the developers eventually led to the company being forced out, leaving the building once again empty. This time, it also ended up on the county's tax sales list. Around the same time, Joplin city leaders were exploring how to handle the increased need for office space for city operations. In 2003, the Joplin City Council approved purchasing the building to meet those needs at a cost of $3 million. Over the next two years, the city spent an additional $3 million to make repairs and remodel the building. The restoration of the building to its place as a downtown landmark is not lost in historical significance. Unfortunately, at one point in time, uh, it hit, hit a very low point, and the uh, condition of the building was, was in deplorable condition. And, uh, you know, obviously inactivity, um, uh, having windows broken and, and uh, 
um, pigeons and other animals coming in and that type of thing um, just has a, a, a deteriorating effect on the building. And so, um, you know, the, uh, it's, it, you really have to see the images to really understand uh, how far uh, the building went uh, in decline um, before you can really appreciate how wonderful it is today. Well, I, th I think it's just a remarkable transformation in the idea that, uh, you know, it was a public building where there was a lot of activity, people coming in daily to shop, and uh, even more in volume when, uh, during the holiday season, etc. But the situation was is that um, it's, it's very people friendly. And today it still is, uh, being the city hall, a very busy place still, people coming in and taking care of business there. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's full of uh, city employees with lots of different departments and a lot of different activities occurring. Uh, to me, you know, obviously you're not, you're not buying goods as far as, um, you know, uh, merchandise items, um, but you're still interacting with that building, still being able to go in there, still uh, realizing and understanding the uh, incredible architectural um, style of the building and, and the, um, the embellishments of the building. So it's just, you know, it's a, it's a step back in time uh, to some degree, but it's also a step into the future and the present as well. So it's just wonderful to see that this building has, uh, has a new lease on life and a, and a great owner. You know, the idea of some owners in the past of um, their longevity, their commitment. Uh, and I think uh, clearly the city has a great commitment to this project and we'll see this thing through uh, for many, many years. And so others, uh, generations, new generations that haven't uh, even been born yet will be able to experience and enjoy this, this Newman building. But the point of history and why we need to understand uh, that is so that we can convey that message to the, to the new folks that, uh, that aren't here yet, uh, that are, will be coming, and so they can understand how this all piece, was pieced together. The Newman Building today is more than a place to visit to take care of city business. It also attracts visitors wanting to get a glimpse of Joplin's past. The famous Thomas Hart Benton mural, Joplin at the turn of the century, holds a prominent position by the historic elevators with a more modern depiction of Joplin's history close by. A display area on the mezzanine features the story of the making of the mural. For the people who had a history in the building, its present status is a source of pride. But I was so glad to hear that they were going to redo the building, and it is beautiful. They've done a beautiful job of restoring it and also utilizing it for the city offices. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful building in its own right and it is more uh, attractive today than it was then since they have done all the remodeling. City employees also share pride in the building. So, you know, I, I count it as a, a real privilege to be able to work in this building. I mean, we've been very blessed to, that the citizens of Joplin saw that foresight to, uh, uh, to support us in, in this building. And, uh, uh, you know, you walk in the mornings and you walk by those window showcases and um, I can still remember as you come in the door the, the little small window showcasings, the, you know, the, the, the pretty little hats and the purses and the jewelry that had always decorate those windows and um, they were always just, uh, just perfect, you know, always elegant. So um, the staircase coming to the mezzanine area, I um, can always remember that being such a, uh, when you're a child and small, it's it looks very grand and it, and it still does. <laughs> it is a community and you know and the mayor echoed the words you know very graciously that it is the citizens building. It's city hall. It belongs to everybody. So even though we may not be a retail business in this in this establishment now as it was many years ago, we still are here for the community in whatever way they may need us. Most definitely I think it is a, is a great source of pride and I think you know the, the, the folks that remember going in there and, uh, and shopping uh, to the current folks that are now doing, taking care of business uh, on the, on, in governmental affairs um, are, uh, I think, are very, very pleased to see that this is a, uh, a wonderful building and uh, so pleased that it's part of our community again. As the Newman Building moves along in its second century in downtown Joplin, the grand old lady stands proudly behind the city as it moves towards the future. If these walls could talk, they would have quite a story to tell.